We're now turning to least squares, which is really the third part of the book um, and an important part of the course. So we'll jump right in and I'll tell you what the least squares problem is and we'll get to how to solve it. Actually, it's the math that's not very complicated. Uh, what's exciting about least squares are all the, all the things you can do with it, the applications. Okay, so here's the least squares problem. Uh, we start with an M by N matrix A, which is tall. So that means that M is bigger than N. And that says that the set of equations AX equals B is overdetermined. You have more equations than you have unknowns. And that implies that for most uh, choices of B, the right-hand side, there is no solution. There's no X that satisfies AX equals B. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the residual uh, R, and that's AX minus B. It means it's the residual in the equation. It means that it's the amount by which the equation doesn't satisfy. So if R equals zero, the residual, that means X is actually a solution of AX equals B. Uh, now, in this case, when A is tall, uh, for most B, there isn't an X that makes the residual zero. So what we're going to do is this. We're going to choose X that makes the residual as small as possible. And we'll use that, we'll, we'll, it'll be small as possible in the norm or the norm squared, because if you minimize the norm, it's the same as minimizing the norm squared. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna minimize the sum of squares of the residual. That's how we're gonna choose X. Um, now, this is called the objective function. It's a scalar, it's a non-negative scalar. Um, and it's the objective function. And it's one that we want, when we're gonna choose X, we want that to be as small as possible. That, that's, the, uh, that, that's what we want. Um, and so we'll say that X hat is a solution of the least squares problem if the following holds. If the objective value for X hat is less than or equal to the objective value for any other X, that's it. So roughly speaking, it says it's the best, it's the best, if it's the best you can do in terms of making the residual small. Okay, so that's the, that's the condition. Um, X hat minimizes the objective. That's the right, to, or you would say X hat minimizes the norm or norm squared of the residual. Okay, um, now this has got other names too. This is just least squares, um, and it's got many, many other names depending on the application. For example, in statistics, uh, people would call it regression. Uh, that's where you're fitting some data, and we'll see that later. Okay, now uh, X hat, um, we will shortly get to how do you compute X hat or what is X hat. There'll be a formula for it and it will not be unsurprising, the formula. Uh, but for now, we'll say that if you choose X that minimizes the, the norm squared of the residual, uh, we're, we're going to call that a least squares approximate solution of AX equals B. Um, now, I, I have to tell you, uh, that's because in general, it is false. It, this is, in general, we don't have this, right? That generally does not occur. Um, okay, so some people, an older terminology for a least squares uh, approximate solution of this is people say that X hat is sometimes called a solution of AX equals B in the least square sense. Um, don't say that. I'll tell you why. Because it's not a solution of AX equals B in any sense. It, a solution of AX equals B is a vector that satisfies AX equals B and X hat generally does not satisfy that. So don't say that. Um, it's very confusing. Uh, please don't say it. And actually don't hang out with people who say stuff like that because it's just, you know, it, it's not cool. So, but I just wanted to warn you, some people say this, it's that X hat is a solution of AX in the least square sense, which doesn't mean anything. Okay, fine. Now, um, as I've said a couple times, uh, X hat, the solution of the least squares problem, generally doesn't satisfy AX hat equals B. It merely minimizes the norm of the residual. It does not make it zero. Uh, now, if you have an X hat that does satisfy AX equals B, then I guarantee you it's the solution because the norm squared of zero is zero and norm squareds don't come any smaller than zero. So it, would, it is actually in that case the minimum. So it, it generalizes the idea of an actual solution. I want to give a couple of uh, interpretations of least squares uh, before we get to how do you actually compute it or, or uh, what's a formula for it, which we'll see shortly. Um, so let's let A1 through AN be the columns of, of A, the matrix. And then we're going to write out AX in terms of its columns. And so um, AX is, well, it's nothing more than a linear combination of the columns of A. 
that's written here, with coefficients that are given by x, the xi's. Um, so what it says is that the norm squared of ax minus b, that's the residual, um, is this thing, minus b. This is ax, but written out by columns. Um, and what it says is that the loose, least squares problem is trying to find a linear combination of the columns of a that is closest to b, because this is the distance between this thing and this thing squared. So that's a, that's a geometric interpretation. So it's, it says, among all linear combinations of the columns of a, find me one that is closest to b. Okay. Um, now, if x hat is a solution to the least squares problem, then the m vector a x hat that's this thing. That would be this thing here. That is the vector which is closest to B among all linear combinations of the columns of A. Okay? I mean, essentially by definition. Now we have a row interpretation as well. <laughs> Let's let A1 tilde transpose up to AM tilde transpose be the rows of A. A is here, it's M by N. Okay? So we have, uh, these are the rows. Um, and the residuals, now we can write it in terms of the rows. Um, Ai tilde transpose x is, uh, is going to be Ax, the ith component, and then minus bi. So this is, this is the ith component of the residual. It's A tilde transpose x minus bi. Um, now the least squares objective we can write, well, it's the sum of the squares of the r's. So that means we just write it out this way, like that. And what that says, is it's the, it, it's the sum of the squares uh, of, of, of the residuals um, a given, and the residuals are each given by the, these things involving the rows of A. Okay, so when you choose X to minimize the sum of the squares of the residuals, as you do in least squares, what you're really doing is you're taking these sort of M numbers, you're adding them up and making the sum as small as possible. And that's sort of a way to make all of them small. I mean, they won't, they won't all be zero or maybe even none of them will be zero, but that's kind of the idea here. Okay, so, um, and we can say a couple things. Actually solving the equation ax equals b is when you make every residual zero. Uh, as I said, that's generally not possible when, they're, when the system of equations is overdetermined. So instead what you're, we're gonna do is, as a compromise, try to make the sum of the squares small, right? Okay, that's the row interpretation. Um, <clears throat> Let's look at a little example just to sort of get a picture for what it looks like. Um, here's a matrix A. I mean, this is silly and it's so simple they wouldn't do this, but we'll, we'll, well, we'll, we'll get to that later. So here's a matrix A. It's three by two. And here's B. Uh, and we consider the set of equations AX equals B. Well, there is no solution of that. And we can quickly figure that out because if I told you that A times X1, X2 is equal to B, like that, then we can work out some of what this implies, right? From the first, the first entry of AX is going to be 2X1, and that must equal 1. So cool, X1 is a half. And the last entry says 2X2 is equal to minus 1. And so that says that X1 equals a half, and we just conclude that X2 equals minus a half. Um, oh, so we know X. Great. This is if it were a solution. There's that middle equation, and unfortunately, in that case, when we find out what it is, it is going to be, uh, the second entry is not going to be zero. Unfortunately, it is going to be minus one, okay? So, so with this choice, uh, AX, my, a AX is going, uh, minus B is going to be something like zero, uh, minus one, and zero. So, you know, good news is we solved the first and the third equation. Uh, bad news, we missed on the middle equation, okay? But that's exactly kind of what least squares is supposed to help us with. Okay, so, um, all right. So least, the least squares problem is to choose x to minimize. Here's norm ax minus b squared. And because it's just two entries, x1 and x2, I've just written it out completely here with no vector, uh, no, no vector matrix notation at all. It's just, it's just this. It's 2x minus 1 squared plus this thing plus that thing. And these are the residuals just written out. Okay, now this function um, is plotted here. Um, in the sense, these are level curves. So it turns out the minimum occurs when x hat is a third minus a third. Now, you could get that using calculus. If you like, just take this, this expression, take the partial derivative with respect to x1, set it equal to zero, take the partial derivative with respect to x2, set it equal to zero, and you'll find that x1 and x2 are a third and minus a third. 
Um, so that's what you get. Um, and up, up here, what I've plotted is the objective, uh, which is f. So this is f of x here, um, like that. And it has its absolute minimum value here at one third minus one third. Um, then what these lines show is where it has other values. So this is when the value is one is is one bigger than the value at x hat, and so on. And so these are ellipsoids. That's not an ex that's I mean that doesn't these are ellipses. It doesn't that's not a surprise. Well, yeah. So um, but the idea, and you can see that it's getting steeper and steeper here. But the small the the value where it's smallest is right there. It's this one third minus one third, um, and uh, that smallest value is in fact norm ax minus b squared, ax hat minus b squared, is actually two thirds. Um, by the way, I want to notice something that beats our previous solution. Right, our previous idea was we would take x one equals a half, x two equals minus a half. That gives you this residual zero minus one zero, and the sum of the squares of that is one. Okay, so and two thirds is indeed smaller than one. So I mean, it had to be because this is this. This is the value that it, that gives the lowest value of the norm square of the residual. Okay, um, and if we form a x hat, we get this vector here: two thirds minus two thirds minus two thirds, and that is the linear combination of these two columns that is closest to the right hand side, b. Okay, so this is just a picture. Um, you can visualize it because it's in two dimensions. Now, we're not going to actually be interested in any problem with two variables. We're going to be interested in a problem with 20 or 20,000 uh, or something like that, a very large number of variables. We'll see that that's all possible. Okay. What we're going to do now is actually uh, work out the solution of the least squares problem. Uh, so, and it's going to be not too surprising, and it's going to involve... Uh, uh, matrices and ideas that you have already been uh, introduced to. Okay, now we're going to make one assumption, and that is that A has linearly independent columns, right? So that's going to be our, our standing assumption for least squares. Uh, now that implies that the grand matrix is invertible. Um, that's something we saw uh, in the last chapter, uh, that that's invertible. Um, and then it turns out, I'll just tell you what the solution of the least squares problem is. It's precisely this. It's actually A transpose A inverse A transpose B. And you will recognize that as something you've already seen. It's the pseudo inverse times B. That's it. So the pseudo inverse is the matrix that maps the right-hand side to the least squares solution. That's, that's, what, that's, what, that's, what, a, that, that's what the uh, pseudo inverse or A dagger is. <coughs> now look, this is actually kind of cool. It looks like A inverse B. Um, and in fact, as you know, when A is square, a dagger is a inverse, so it's a very nice extension of the uh, of just solving a set of equations. If you if you if you have a square matrix A and its uh, its columns are invert or its columns are linearly independent, that means it's it's non singular, it's invertible, and that means the solution is just A inverse B. Now you know that when A is tall and has uh, and, and and has linearly independent columns, the the solution of the least squares problem is a dagger B. So it looks the same. Um, so that's the solution. I'm about to, I'll show it. We'll, we'll actually show it two different ways from two different traditions. Um, but I just want to mention something. Uh, oh, I should mention one thing. It, it shows you that a dagger is very closely related to, to the inverse. Um, and now you realize that what a dagger act, uh, B gives you is not a solution. It's actually least squares approximate solution. That's the correct way to say it. Um, let me say a little bit about this in, um, in uh, uh, how this works in various computer languages. In, in some languages and or packages for linear algebra, um, there is a symbol. This is not math. So this is something that just appears in code. Uh, and it's the backslash. So, and the way people write that is you write x equals like a backslash b. Now, I, what I have to tell you is this, everything here, this is math. Okay, this is all in math. Uh, this is this is not math. You walk over to the math department and say a backslash b, no one will have a clue what you're talking about. But in several packages for linear algebra, backslash is a very cool thing. What it means is if a is square and invertible, it means a inverse b. If a is tall and has uh, linearly independent columns, it means a dagger b. So 
It's basically three characters to get the least squares solution. That's what that looks like in a lot of computer languages. But you have to be very careful and always distinguish between, you know, you have two different dialects. You have the, you have math. This is math here. Um, and then you also have how it's expressed in various linear algebra packages or languages and things like that. But backslash is, is common. And you, you may see it uh, in, in somewhere. Depends on what languages you, you work with. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to derive it uh, via calculus. I mean, after all, you did, well, I didn't say you did, you were forced to take calculus. Um, so let's, uh, you know, one of the few things you actually learn how to do in calculus is to, uh, is to, to at least get sufficient conditions for, su for a function being minimized. So what we'll do is we're going to write out f of x as, uh, actually by entries. So here it is, uh, you can check. Uh, this parentheses here is actually ax minus b sub i. It is the ith component of ax minus b. And this says take the sum of the squares. But there it is written out in all its glory. Uh, now, the solution, x hat, must satisfy the following. That the partial derivative with respect to each x has to be 0 at the solution. Okay. Now, by the way, uh, if this were false, it would mean that if you moved a little bit uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, in the direction of, let's say, the negative gradient, uh, then what would happen is f would get smaller. And that would show that you were a liar when you said that x hat actually minimizes f. Okay. So I don't have to go into that. That's, I'm remind, that's, that's calculus. That's, you're supposed to have seen that or something. Okay. Now, um, we can take partial derivatives of, of this thing with respect to xk. Um, and it's kind of a pain. I mean, it's not a bad thing to do, uh, but you can do it. Uh, the good news is there's a lot of terms in here that don't contain xk, and, and therefore they don't matter because they're constants, and so the partial derivative is zero. Um, however, when you work out what the gradient is, I'm not going to go through this derivation, but it's in the book, and you can take a look at it if you like, um, is you end up finding that the gradient, the kth entry of the gradient, which is in fact this partial derivative, is nothing but 2a transpose ax minus b. Um, in other words, <clears throat> the gradient is 2a transpose ax minus b. Actually, that's kind of cool because it, it does generalize uh, what would be the case if a were a scalar, right? If I walked up to you on the street and said, please minimize this, where everything involved is a scalar, and a, a, a is a, a scalar, x is scalar, b is a scalar, you would say no problem, and you take the derivative. And the derivative of this would be 2 times ax minus b times a. And you would say that that's equal to zero, okay? And you know you would uh, you would derive the solution, which is silly. Uh, the solution is going to be x equals in this case b over a, and you actually just solve the problem exactly. So okay. All I want to point out is that this this expression for a scalar uh, turns out the correct the the expression for a matrix is that, and they look very similar. But there's a big difference uh, here. The difference is, you know, first of all, the A appears on the left and it's transposed, right? So, uh, so here's actually my advice for how to handle things like this. When you look at a matrix equation, when there is an obvious analog of a scalar equation, um, derive the scalar equation, put it on some paper or something like that, because you're going to destroy the evidence later. Okay, so you, 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 you work it out like this. You work out the, the derivative, the gradient is, that, that's the derivative, right? Then what? But this just get this just tells you. Look, it should look something like that, but it has to be matrix appropriate, right? So, uh, for example, here's what you should not do: is say, oh, that's the derivative. So for matrices, it should be this, right? Times a. Well, because well, I mean that's the obvious analog of this. Now, a couple of problems with this. Number one is it it doesn't even make sense syntactically, right? That you cannot multiply ax minus b, which is a vector on the right by this matrix A. doesn't make any, it just doesn't work. So this is just very wrong. But what you do do is you keep this here, and then when you, when you derive the correct matrix equation, you look at it and you go, uh-huh, okay. This scalar equation generalizes to that matrix vector equation this way. And that's, this is just a very good way to do this. Okay, so back to the gradient equal to zero. When I expand this, what I get is I get two a transpose a times x hat minus 2 a transpose b equals 0. And 
when I move things around, I move this to the other side, divide by two, I get these things. And these equations are very famous and they have a name. They're called the normal equations for this least squares problem. So that's the normal equations. Um, and you can see that the coefficient matrix is actually the gram matrix, uh, which we know about already. Um, okay, so that's it. And of course, if A has linearly independent columns, then that tells you that A transpose A, the gram matrix, is invertible. And so I get my solution like that, which is just what we said it was going to be. It is, it is nothing more than A dagger B. It's the pseudo inverse times B. Okay, so that's a derivation from calculus. <clears throat> I think there's a couple of weird things about the calculus thing. Number one, if you go back and read the fine print in your calculus book, it's going to tell you this. It's going to tell you that the minimizer has the gradient equal to zero. Um, so, fine. But it, if you read the fine print, all the legalese, what you're going to find is that the gradient can be zero and you might not be a minimum. So, you could be a maximum or what's called a saddle point or something. Now, in this particular case, everything is cool because, in fact, there was only one solution of the gradient equals zero, and that is this one. It's this, so it has to be the minimizer. But it's a little bit weird because it could just as well have been the maximizer. Okay, now, the next derivation uh, is a more direct verifica uh, verification, and I personally prefer it. So, here it is. Um, <coughs> and we'll directly show that x hat equal a dagger b minimizes the norm squared of ax minus b. Let's see how that works. So I'm going to define x hat to be this thing. And then, well, you can just check uh, from that. It says that a transpose a x hat, I'm just going to use this, equals a transpose b. And then from that, I will rewrite that as this. It says that a transpose uh, times a x hat minus b is zero. Um, by the way, it's pretty cool here, right? Uh, this, some people actually make a big deal about that equation there. Uh, so uh, it basically says that a x hat minus b is the optimal residual. And what this says is the optimal residual is orthogonal to all the columns of a, because that's what this equation says, right? So some people make a big deal about that. They even, I think they even call it like the orthogonality principle or something, which is fine. I don't object. But the point is, it's just this equation. Okay. Now, <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to say, now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to directly show that if you take any other choice of x, any choice of x at all, you will have a norm squared residual, which is at least as big as norm squared residual of ax hat. Uh, I'm sorry, associated with x hat. So let's see how that works. Norm ax minus b squared is this. And um, what I have done in this equation is very silly. Um, what I've done is added and subtracted the same thing inside. So here I've added ax hat, and here I've subtracted it. Well, that's weird. Like, why would you do that? And the answer is, hang on and wait, and we'll see. Now I'm going to use uh, I'm going to use a formula for the norm squared of the sum of two vectors, and that is always equal to the norm squared of the first vector plus the norm squared of the second vector plus two times the inner product between the two vectors. And so this I'm writing as this: it's a norm squared of a times x minus x hat plus norm squared of a x hat minus b squared, norm squared, sorry, plus and then twice the inner product of this vector times that vector. And that's this thing here. Uh -huh. Okay, now, uh, because what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do the product, uh, transpose of a product. So here I have a times the vector x minus x hat transpose, and I'm going to rewrite that as the, I'm going to transpose each of them and reverse the order. So that's x minus x hat transpose a transpose a x hat minus b. And now we look up here and we realize for our choice of x hat, uh, a transpose times a x hat minus b is zero. Uh, and if you like, you could invoke the orthogonality principle or whatever you like. So this, this is zero. And this whole thing just goes away. And you get this. And so now let's sit back and see what equation we have. It's pretty awesome, actually. It says this. It says that ax hat minus b, sorry, ax minus bx is anything at all, any vector at all. So norm squared is equal to uh, ax hat minus b norm squared plus, and then this thing, whatever it is, it's always positive, right? So that says that this is always bigger than that for any choice of x, period. That means we're done. That, that shows you directly that x hat minimizes norm squared 
ax minus b. Because here, I've shown that for any other choice of x, that norm squared is at least as big. It's actually even interesting to see what it tells you. It even says that, you know, how big it is depends on how far you are from x hat. Right, so, okay, so that's it. Um, to see that it's unique, um, we can figure that out too, right? Um, if I had two solutions, x hat and x, then uh, they would both have to have the same value, and then this, this has to be zero, and that tells you x equals x hat. So that, that gives you uniqueness as well. So that's the direct verification that the solution of the approximate uh, of the least squares problem is nothing more than a dagger times b. Um, so the good news is you've already seen it, you've already, you, you already know, you've already, you've already been introduced to the pseudo-inverse, um, and so on. Now, it also tells us how we can compute it. So, um, then the way we do this via the QR factorization, you'll remember that the QR factorization is, um, was one way that we had to express the pseudo-inverse, and so we'll just use that. So, <laughs> we'll, we start by computing the QR factorization of A, that's A equals QR. That costs you two M N squared flops. Um, oh, let me uh, point one thing uh, out uh, here. Um, so uh, if this fails, it's because A has dependent columns. But remember, that's our that's our that's our assumption here is that the columns of A are linearly independent, which implies, by the way, that Graham Schmidt will term will terminate successfully, and it also guarantees that a QR factorization exists. Okay. Um, now, we're going to compute x hat, which is a dagger b, which is r inverse q transpose b. You'll remember that from last lecture. Um, and the way we do that is we're going to form q transpose b. That's two mn flops. And then we're going to compute x hat, which is r inverse q transpose b. We, we, we calculated this. And that's an upper triangular matrix. That's solving an upper triangular, uh, a system of linear equations with an upper triangular coefficient matrix. And that's just back substitution. And that's n squared flops. So both of these are actually negligible compared to this. So the one that really counts is simply the QR factorization is 2mn squared flops. And by the way, this is, this is absolutely identical to the algorithm for solving AX equals B for square invertible A. Um, it's, it's literally the same algorithm, right? You form a QR factorization, you form Q transpose B, and then you do back substitution with, with R. Now, if a is square, and of course this means it's invertible, this just solves AX equals B, but if A is tall, then the exact same algorithm leads to the least square solution. So it's kind of cool. Uh, oh, and by the way, this is maybe why a lot of these uh, packages use this backslash notation to represent both solving a set of linear equations and solving a least squares problem.